You know, the world's a pretty big place when you think about it. But do you ever stop to consider why you live where you do in this world? I mean, why this state or that city or this neighborhood or your street for that matter? Most of us tend to think about where we live in terms of places that meet our needs. You know, good school systems, good community services, lower taxes, affordability, that sort of thing. But have you ever stopped to consider that perhaps God placed you where you live for a different reason altogether? Perhaps we live where we live not to have our needs met, but to meet the needs of the people around us. Jeremiah 29, 7 reads, Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. Seek the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Every Christ follower should be a gift to his or her neighborhood, and every church should be a gift to its city. God has placed us and our church in this part of his world for a purpose, to make an impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our neighborhood as a church, and it's home to more than 600,000 names and faces, and over 50% of them report they have no connection to a church at all. That is every other person you meet. They are the reason we are here. Since the opening of our Kesslinger and Mill Creek campuses, our ability to love and serve our neighbors has grown immensely. Our Shepherd's Heart Care Center started out as just a closet of extra food and now serves well over a thousand people every month. Our Masterpiece Ministries reach and serve dozens of families of children with special needs in our community. We are increasingly becoming a church not for ourselves, but for our neighbors. And as we've grown, God has made it increasingly clear to us that our greatest impact is not going to happen by building bigger and bigger facilities at any one campus. We believe we must reproduce ourselves by strategically placing campuses in the communities we're already poised to reach. We are convinced that God is leading us toward becoming a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This neighborhood church vision is to strategically expand and multiply our gospel impact through establishing neighborhood churches. It means we must also intentionally develop new leaders in all areas of ministry. We've already begun this through our Leadership Institute and expanding it through our pastoral residency program. It means developing new opportunities, keeping our eyes open for communities in need, and cultivating hearts of compassion that can see the opportunities emerging for gospel impact. Ministries like our Shepherd's Heart Care Center, Masterpiece Ministry, Support and Care Ministries have been reaching the unique needs of our neighbors, and we are only just beginning. More importantly, it means more people transformed by the gospel, experiencing grace, growing in faith, and making an impact right where they are. It means people like you. You see, we cannot do this without you. You are the gospel agent in your home. You are the chapel on your street and in your neighborhood. There are 300,000 people right around us who do not know the hope of the gospel. What could God do if everyone watching this committed to loving and serving their neighbors? This is what the Neighborhood Church vision is all about. It's about the gospel, the church, the neighborhood, and you. I don't know who that was, but his voice is so soothing on that video. <laughs> Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Lord, you told us in your word that it's living and active and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and it's able to pierce our thoughts and intentions and even divide it right down to the soul. We don't always like that, but we need it, and so we're asking you to speak to us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Every day is a winding road. Life is a highway. I'm going to be 5,000 miles. I'm a rambling man. I'm a traveling man. I'm the wanderer on the road again. What do all these phrases have in common? Song titles. Fantastic song titles, by the way. It was not hard, you can imagine, to Google search uh, song titles that talk about life as a journey or a pathway or a road or traveling. It's a common theme in poetry and songs in our culture and across human experience. This is how we talk about life and think about life as a path, as a journey. Sometimes a journey with no destination, but it you might surprise you to find out that the scriptures talk about it the same way, although differently with a destination, that life is a journey. We are traveling. We are headed somewhere. And 
Sometimes that journey and that path and that, uh, you know, through life is smooth sailing and fun and exciting. See, an image here, my wife and I, we went on a hike when we were in Scotland, and uh, this is a picture of part of that hike, and isn't she, I mean, it beautiful? Sometimes it's beautiful, and, it's, and you just, I, I want to walk this path and see where it leads, and the sun is shining, and you're with people you love, and it's good. Another picture of that same hike, uh, the stairway we came across. Doesn't that, doesn't that look inviting? Like you just want to climb those stairs, don't you? You want to know where those lead? To more steeper stairs that are less fun, by the way, in case you're wondering. <laughs> <laughs> but other times, life is not like this at all. The path is not smooth, sunny, inviting with birds singing and everything's awesome. Like the Lego movie. Everything is awesome. <laughs> Sometimes it's treacherous and difficult and you feel like unsettled and you feel unsteady on your feet and you feel like you don't know if you're going to slip off this path or if it's a good path to be on at all. Looks like this. I, this is not a hike that I was ever on and would not go on, uh, but I found it on Google. <laughs> like, that guy looks like he's having fun, but who would go there? Sometimes it feels like this, like, like you're just not even sure what... And it, and, and it might surprise you that in, in the Psalms, one of these, the Psalm we're going to look at this morning, Psalm 73, the psalmist uses this imagery to talk about his own struggle. Life is a journey where his feet are slipping, where he's in danger of stumbling or falling off the path as a metaphor for his struggle through life. The psalmist is a guy named Asaph. Asaph is an ancient worship leader from Israel, God's people, the Israelites. He wrote a number of the psalms. He wrote them to be sung by God's people, but he also wrote this one, we believe, out of his own experience and struggle and difficulty stumbling on the path, as it were. Let's read. I'll read verses 1 through 15. You can follow along in your own Bible or on the screen from Psalm 73. A psalm of Asaph. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. I'm not sure that's a compliment. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts to the earth. Therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I said I would speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Asaph uses the imagery of slipping or losing a foot or stumbling from the path. It's the, the idea of somebody who's ascending, climbing, in their, in their faith. And so the metaphor of slipping or stumbling is to lose your faith or to struggle with it in some way, to fall off the path of faith. And his struggle surrounds a question. Did you hear the question? His, his stumbling or struggling, because this really is a psalm of struggle and how that struggle is resolved. His struggle is a question about life. I don't know if you caught it. He begins, surely God is good to Israel. I know that the Bible says you're good. But my feet had almost slipped. Why? Because I looked out at the world and what I saw out there did not match what I read in here. And I thought, I don't, I don't see it. I mean, I, I know it says it, but I don't see it. In what particular way did he not see it? In verse 3, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. That's it. Why do the wicked win? That doesn't make any sense. The righteous suffer, and people who don't even care about you, God, seem to be succeeding. This does not seem right or fair. Losing perspective. We, we, we all, you know what this perspective is like and cause you to stumble when, when something, like for example, you ever walk on a curb? I like to walk on curbs because it makes me think I have great balance. But the curb's six inches off the ground. You put that same curb 20 feet off the ground, I'm not any good at walking on that thing. My knees begin to shake and I'm unsteady. Why? It's the same exact width. Fear, I see it different. My perspective has changed. I see things now that are telling my mind that it's not safe to walk on. This is what Asaph's saying. I, I, yeah, I know what it says, but I don't, I don't see it. 
My perspective has changed. I want to just suggest to you that this, this struggle is normal and necessary. That the struggle of the psalmist here in Psalm 73 is not wrong. It's not bad. It's normal. It's something we all experience. You've asked this question, and you, and you will again in some ways. And not only is it normal, it's, 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 it might actually be the very thing necessary for you to grow in your understanding of who God is and his love for you. I, in fact, I, maybe you grew up in a tradition, a church tradition, I, I've talked to many people who have, where this kind of questioning God was, was not okay. It was not okay to question God. You shouldn't ask these questions because if you ask questions, you're losing your faith and he's God and who are you to question him and you better just... And so what do you do with that? Because the questions are real. The struggle is real. What do you do with it? Suppress it? Pretend it's not there? Ignore it? How does that help you grow? Or maybe like a man I've talked to before said, well, there must be something wrong with me. Or something wrong with God. I want you to know the Bible never it marginalizes the struggler or the questioner. We know a guy named Thomas from the New Testament. We call him Doubting Thomas. We know his nickname for it. God didn't leave him in his question, but he didn't shame him. He didn't punish him for having that question. In fact, he met him at the very place of his questions. So maybe you're here this morning, you've got your questions and you've got your struggles, and you don't see how this, what you hear in the Bible, lines up with what you experience in life. I just want you to know, it, nothing else, that's okay. You, it's okay to be here and have those questions. We believe God has answers and wants to lead you to them. They don't come easy, but it's okay to have them. The struggle is normal and even necessary. And verses 3 through 11 are a description of the wicked. Some of these things are strange, right? He says, uh, and by the way, when you hear wicked, it's easy to think, well, those terrible people out there. It's a description of anybody who's orienting their, in, orienting their life without the presence and, and acknowledgement and will of God, which could be any of us and all of us. And notice what he says. He says, their bodies are fat and sleek. What does that mean? Is that a compliment? All the fat people are, what, what, is, it, what is he saying? But when I used to take uh, mission trips to Ecuador when I was a youth pastor, I, I was larger than I am now. And we, we would go and, and do these work projects and, and do, with the kids from the local villages. And all the little kids in Ecuador nicknamed me. You know what they called me? El Gordo. <laughs> I see you speak Spanish. <laughs> if you don't know, that means fat. <laughs> the fat one. Hey, fatty, they would say to me, right? I, and, and I used to be like, I was slightly offended. And one of the missionaries said, oh, no, no, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a condescending term. They mean like a big guy. I think he was just being nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> but in some cultures, to be called that means you get to eat. In some places in the world, to be hefty means you're not worried about where your next meal is coming from. What he's saying here is, these are the people that have plenty, that are doing fine. They look fine, they're doing fine. And not only that, but in verses 9 through 11, they set their mouths against the heavens and their tongue struts through the earth. It means they, they don't acknowledge God. They acknowledge themselves. In verse 10, Therefore people turn back to them and find no fault in them. In other words, he's saying these people, not only are they succeeding, they're thumbing their nose at God and, and, and don't care a lick about his will. And people are turning to them for advice and guidance and counsel. This should not be. Boy, this, is a, this is a description of our culture, isn't it? This is a description of our day. Where do people turn for counsel, for advice, for guidance? Where do you go to know what it means? We're raising generations. Well, where does a young man look to see what does it mean to be a man in our culture? Is that even okay to say anymore? What does it mean to be a woman? What does that mean? Where can I look? Where can I find an example to follow? And we're looking in all the wrong places. Well, one thing it means is to be honest about our struggle. Sometimes men... We're told to be a man means you don't acknowledge that you have weakness or struggle. Well, that is not the Bible's version of what a man is, or a woman for that matter. And here's what he's saying. These people are winning, and everybody thinks they're the ones to go to. And I don't get it, God. I don't see it. Why do you let them get away with it? C.S. Lewis said in his book, The Weight of Glory, the danger for most of us is not that we would cease to believe in God altogether, but that we might come to believe such dreadful things about him. For most of you, the danger is not you're going to walk out of here and have an experience of life that's going to cause you to instantly become an atheist, but that you might slide into wrong-headed thinking about who God is and what he's like. 
because of how you can't reconcile life with what you read and what you are taught. Lewis also said that God is a great iconoclast. You know, who knows what an iconoclast is, anybody? The word means idol smasher. Middle Ages, somebody who went in and broke idols. What does Lewis mean that God is an iconoclast? God is an idol smasher. He says, I want God, not my idea of God. I mean, here's what he's saying. You've got ideas about God. I've got ideas about God. At best, they're partial ideas. None of us have a complete, perfect idea of God. He's infinite. We're finite. At worst, they're misguided and wrong. And God, in his mercy, breaks the idols of our ideas about him. Why? To give us more of the truth. To give us more of the real thing. And that breaking of our ideas sometimes is unsettling. Sometimes it's, it doesn't feel good. But it's the very thing that can lead us to give, get more of him. A greater understanding of who he is. It's how we grow. And it's not bad to have these. G.K. Chesterton said that doubt often masquerades as more intellectual than it actually is. There's something personal behind it most of the time. In his book, uh, his essay, The Advancement of Learning, Sir Francis Bacon, how's that for quoting in church, Sir Francis Bacon, he says, if you begin in certainty, you're going to end in doubt. But if you begin in doubt, you may end in certainty. What's he saying? If you don't ask questions, you won't grow. If you start off thinking you know it all, you're going to end up in a bad place. But if you begin with the question, the doubt, the struggle, that's a good thing. But here's the question. How do we struggle and question and still hold on to faith? How does that work? Two things. Proverbs 3, verse 6 says that we acknowledge the Lord. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make what? He will direct your paths, make your paths straight. Remember the metaphor. And then at the end of that, that proverb, then you'll walk on your way securely and your foot will not stumble. So the one thing we must do is acknowledge God. Don't jettison your faith. Don't ignore him. And number two, Psalm 119, verse 105. It's the longest psalm in all the Bible, longest chapter in all the Bible. It's all about God's law. He says, your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my what? Path. Two things, acknowledging God and seeking him in his word are the way that you wrestle through these questions and still hold on to your faith. Verse 16, Asaph says, when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task, meaning I could not think my way out of this struggle. I couldn't reason my way out of this question. I couldn't, couldn't get there. It overwhelmed me. And I think that's true. You never really fully deal with your doubts purely intellectually. Because most of our doubts are not purely intellectual. There's some pain behind them. Most people think that faith is somehow opposed to reason. Like you either got to check your mind at the door, blind faith, or you operate by reason. The Bible says that that's not, that there's a false distinction. That we walk by faith, not by sight. But faith is not irrational. It's beyond re reason. You can think your way so far, and then God has something more for you. Lewis, again, uh, in the book Mere Christianity, says that there's a, imagine a woman who meets a very rich, handsome, intelligent guy who is very interested in her. But ten of her very closest friends, who she trusts more than anyone else in the world, tell her this guy is bad news and will only hurt her. She knows her friends love her, and she rationally believes their warning, but she goes out with him anyway. Why? It's not that she has new information about this guy. Why does she do it? It's because she's having an emotional or personal experience that contradicts what her mind knows. This is what happens to us all the time. Yeah, yeah, I know, but he's nice, right? I know what it's, I know, but. And we can apply this in so many areas of our life. In your faith, I know, I know, I know, but my experience is contradicting what I think I know. This is what's happening here. And I want to just tell you that, that the struggle is not the end of the story. The struggle is not the end of the story. Let's read verses 16 through 25 and see how the story resolves. When I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them to fall in ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrorists, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. 
when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Hear what he's saying? When I was embittered, meaning I looked out, I just didn't, I was, I was embittered about, about my experience of life. I was like an ignorant beast in that moment toward you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The psalm begins with tension. It ends in this glorious resolution. But how did it get there? It doesn't always wrap up so nice and neat for us in, in a poem. But he gives us three things that I want to walk you through that we can apply to our own struggles when we have them. You might call them a cure for doubt, if you will. Three things that Asaph does. Number one, deconstruct your doubts. Or you might say doubt your doubts. We've always got to be willing to distill, where is this coming from? Where is this objection coming from? I talk to people who have intellectual doubts, and if you dig deep enough, very often, over 90% of the time, what's behind it is some personal pain. It's not just an intellectual objection. It's something they've suffered, some injustice done to them. And this is true in the psalm, if you listen closely. Asaph begins by saying, why do they, wicked, win? But listen to what he says in verses 13 and 14. All in vain I've kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been stricken. You hear the pronoun usage there? I, me, my. In other words, this is not just an intellectual objection of what I see out there. My life is hard. I'm suffering. And he's asking the question, is it worth it for me to be faithful to you? Now we're getting honest, right, about our struggle. It's not just, I don't understand what I see intellectually in the world. It's, I'm suffering and that doesn't feel right to me because I'm trying to be a good person here. I'm trying to do right by you, God. And they're not. Why do I suffer? Which of us hasn't asked this? It's part of a funeral yesterday for a man from the Batavia community named Jason Prescott, very involved in the community. Wife and four beautiful children. Died tragically in his early 40s. Why him? Why now? Why that family? Which of us hasn't asked this question? I don't, I don't understand this. Why is this happening? So deconstructing our doubts, being honest about where the doubt is really coming from. I remember hearing Bill Maher, who's not a good source for theological information, but he said, I could never believe in a God who would allow evil and suffering in the world. <clears throat> Let's deconstruct that for a minute, can we? I could never believe in a God who would allow evil and suffering in the world. Evil and suffering exists in the world. Agreed? Yes? Anybody disagree with that? No. So God, who you Christians say is good and all-powerful, either does not exist or he isn't who you say he is. And therefore, I can't believe in him because this exists. What's he really saying? Because I can't see a reason for this, evil and suffering, therefore this, a God, cannot exist. He's saying, because I can't see a reason for it, there can't be one, which means he's in the position of God. Let's unpack it, right? Unpack where this is, objection is coming from. Frankly, even though I struggle with the same questions you do, I don't want a God that I can always understand. Do you? Do you want a God that always perfectly makes sense to you? You should say no, because if you have a God that always perfectly makes sense to you, that means you have a God limited to the measure of your ideas. And your brain is small, <laughs> and your thinking is limited. And so is mine. I want a God bigger than my understanding. That's not always easy. I don't always like it. But deep down inside, I want that. I'm finite and he's infinite. So the first thing is deconstruct your doubts. Second, enter into worship. Enter into worship. The whole psalm turns in two verses. Verses 16 and 17. Let me read them for you. When I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a worrisome task. In other words, I could not think my way out of this. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. What's he saying? There are some struggles in life that you worship your way out of, you don't think your way out of. There are some things that you only gain perspective when you stop trying to, to, to reason it and stand at a distance from it, and you just humbly enter in and trust God. 
Years ago, a friend of mine took his family on vacation to England, and they went to tour some of the big, great houses of England in the countryside. You know, the houses that are always filmed, like they filmed Downton Abbey in these places, these massive mansions that are gorgeous. And they all have these English gardens. Some of them even have labyrinths, uh, the hedgerows, mazes on, in their gardens. He says the one that they visited, they had this massive scaffolding built next to it, and there was this English gentleman who stood on that scaffolding when the families and kids were in the labyrinth. Why? Because they get lost in there. And he has to tell them how to get out. Because little kids and old people apparently are getting lost in the labyrinth all the time. And he has to stand up on that scaffolding and tell them where to go. Can you imagine if that was your job? British accent. Oh, no, no. Turn left. (laughs) Not that way. (laughs) And you, if you're in the labyrinth, you have to trust this voice from above, right? Because he sees what you don't see. All you see is, it's another green wall. I thought I was already here. I can't find my way out. You've got to trust one who sees what you don't see. Because he knows and he sees. And you, you can't think your way to that. You worship your way to that. He says, when I tried to figure it out, it was, I couldn't do it. But then when I came into the sanctuary of God, when I humbled my heart, when I got on my face before God, when I lifted my voice in song, when I poured out my heart to him and I praised him and I acknowledged he's God and I'm not, something happened to my mind. Then I understood There's an understanding that comes when you worship that does not come when you're just working in your head. That's what he's saying. I talked to a young man years ago. I was his youth pastor here, and he was very involved. I had lost touch with him as it happens. And then I saw him in the community years later. And I asked him, how you been? How's how's it going? How's your faith? And he was kind of sheepish and a little embarrassed that I asked him. I haven't been in a long time. I said, why not? Come back. We'd love to have you back. He says, well, I, I, I got a lot of stuff going on. I've made some bad decisions and some stuff has happened and frankly, I've got to sort some things out first before I come back to church. I understand that sentiment. But it's precisely wrong. <laughs> come back and let God help you sort those things out. You're avoiding the very thing you need to sort those things out. Asaph says, I couldn't make sense of life until I worshipped. Until I acknowledged that I don't see everything. I don't have the perspective God has. There's one who sees what I don't see. And then third, last, take his hand. Take God's hand. He he wrestles with this, and then in verse 23, this is just beautiful. He says, nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? Who else can I go to? And on earth, there's nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Pastor Roger Kreitz, who was a dear friend and and on our staff for many years, died of cancer, and this was his favorite psalm in that last verse. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. You know, to disbelieve in God is just as big a leap of faith as to believe in God. Sheldon Van Auken, who was a friend of Lewis's, wrote a book called A Severe Mercy. He said I, I, he had the same issue of pain and struggle that we read here in the psalm. And he said, I realize there's a gap either way. I'm, I'm leaping over a chasm either way, either to faith in God or to the abyss of rejecting him. This, this verse 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I want to talk about that word portion for a minute. I love that word. First of all, it's fun to say. Just say portion. Everybody say portion. No, no, when you say it, go portion. (laughs) Portion. (laughs) Some words in the English language are fun to say, aren't they? Like, I like to say the word curmudgeon. It's, I don't, that's not, I just think it's funny. And bludgeon is a funny word. You shouldn't do it, but it's fun to say it, right? (laughs) Portion is like that. It's a fun word to say. It sounds cool, I think. I, a friend of mine named Jerry Root told a story about this word, and it applies beautifully. It stayed with me for years and years. Jerry said he grew up poor in Los Angeles, and he never had money for lunch. In fact, often he didn't have lunch at all. But one day, his mom scraped up enough money that he could eat hot lunch, and he was so excited about this. But he didn't know how to do it, so he was nervous about getting it wrong. So he figured, I'll just follow the girl in front of me, because she's you know, a pretty girl with a ponytail. I'll do what the rich girl does. So he gave the money to the lunch lady, got his tray. She got her tray. She got her knife and fork. He got his knife and fork, and he just followed her down the line, doing what she did. She came to the, there were string beans, and he didn't like string beans, and he heard her say, I'll only have a small portion of those, please. 
So she just put two string beans on his plate, and he did the same thing. Right down the line, they come to the end, and he sees they have chocolate cake for dessert. And he thought, hey, that word, if it works one way, maybe it also works the other way. So he said to the lunch lady, I'll have a large portion of that, please. And she cut him in his little 10-year-old boy mind this big old slice of chocolate cake and put it on his tray. See, he went back to, the, to his table just like he, like, the, like he just won the lottery, you know? And then he asked this question. Jerry did. And I thought about it all my whole life. Do you want a larger portion of God or a small one? Friends, I want the biggest piece I can get. And here's the thing about God. He's not like chocolate cake. You don't get sick of him. <laughs> he longs to give you more of himself. He longs to give you a bigger portion. And, and, and honestly, for some of you, the way he wants to do that is through your struggle, is through your doubt, is through your wrestling. That's how God wants to give you more of himself. And you're running from that, and you're missing out on what he wants to do to give you more, a larger portion of his grace, of his mercy, of his love, of his presence. Who wants a small piece? Nobody. I want more and more and more. And that's who our God is. He longs to give it to us. And, and Asaph is saying the way through that is, is through pain, through struggle, through wrestling. Life is not easy. The Bible, the Psalms, never paints with a, a glossy brush and just ignore it all. But it also doesn't leave us in our struggle. It points us, where, what do we do with that? What do you do with that? Deconstruct it first. Be honest about it. Enter into worship. Acknowledge, I don't see God, but you do. And reach out and take his hand. Because he longs to give you more of himself. And we're going to finish by coming to the table where we remember, through the symbol of bread and cup, that God has already given us the greatest portion that we could ever ask or imagine in his son Jesus. Jesus is your portion, friends. He's your forgiveness, he's your salvation, he's your security for all eternity, and he's freely given. And so if you're here this morning, it doesn't matter if you're a member, a regular tender, or if you're here for the first time, if you know Jesus as your savior, if you've trusted in him for forgiveness of sin and surrendered your life to him, then you're welcome at his table because it's not our table, it's his. In a moment after I pray, uh, you're gonna be served two cups. Just hold them, they'll be stacked together. Hold them in your hands. When we've all been served, I'll come back up and lead us through taking the elements together. Let's bow. Lord Jesus, you are our portion forever. You are all we will ever need, more than we could ask or imagine. And many of us are wrestling and struggling in some way. And now as we prepare to come to your table, remind us again that you see what we don't see. You died to forgive our sin and to re rescue us from the brokenness of this world. So speak the words of grace that we need to hear in this moment. Help us to be honest with you in our own hearts as we come now to remember you, Lord Jesus, our portion forever. Amen.